Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this colloquial presentation from the School of Information at San Jose State University. I'm Dr. Bill Fisher, the coordinator of our colloquium series, and I'm delighted today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Michael Kivane, who's an associate professor of economics at nearby Santa Clara University. Uh, professor Kivane teaches uh, courses in the economics of gender in developing countries, African ec economic development, and international economics at Santa Clara. And through this, he has become interested in how having uh, good information resources can help uh, a country, a, a community, a village um, provide resources for their population. And uh, in doing so, in, in, in pursuing this interest, he has uh, founded an organization called Friends of African Village Libraries. And he's with us today to talk about the importance of these community libraries and his organization. And so let me turn things over to Michael and let me tell you that I'm delighted to have you with us today. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, the uh, idea uh, uh, for my presentation, brief uh, outline, is, is to give uh, people an idea of the experience that we've had at Friends of African Village Libraries in establishing libraries, implementing reading programs, creating reading materials. I'll also talk a little bit about uh, some of the research results uh, from uh, academic-oriented research that I've done uh, on, on libraries. Uh, and uh, I will uh, also talk about uh, how little we know, in some sense, about what kinds of impacts reading programs have. Uh, I'll then talk uh, a bit about some uh, similar nonprofits uh, and uh, introduce the notion of a, a nascent social movement for promoting libraries and, and, and reading, in, in particular in rural Africa, uh, and, and close with some discussion of, of challenges and the partnerships that uh, actors in those social movements face, notably interacting with local communities, with the national government, uh, and with larger NGOs. Uh, I see a bunch of people online. Want to welcome you to uh, to this uh, colloquium, and I want to encourage you to interrupt uh, if you have questions that are might be pretty short, uh, be a little more interactive. If the question looks like it might be a little longer for me to respond to, then I'd ask you to hold off uh, until the end. I'll, I'll probably talk for about 30, 35 minutes. Uh, and we'll have plenty of time then for discussion for, for some of your questions. But if you have a quick question uh, as I'm going through the slides, uh, please feel free um, to uh, interject and, and I'll try and respond uh, right then. So let me give you an idea of what uh, uh, FAVL uh, is about. This is an organization founded in 2001 uh, by myself and, and some others. So we're an all-volunteer organization here in the United States, uh, and we employ uh, a number of librarians and staff in a variety of countries. We operate presently in four countries. Uh, we operate in Burkina Faso, which is covered there by the pin cushions, uh, and so you can't uh, quite see the name Burkina Faso. Um, we have currently 13 libraries there and a plan, uh, a grant project for expansion to 20 more libraries. We also ha have three libraries that we support in northern Ghana. Over in East Africa, we support libraries in Uganda uh, through a partnership with the Uga Uganda Community Libraries Association. Uh, and with, uh, uh, we support a library in, in Tanzania. The, uh, I'm sorry, let me, Burkina Faso, which is the place that I'm most familiar with, I'm the director of FAVL for West Africa, Burkina Faso is uh, a small landlocked country in West Africa with about uh, 16 million people. And our uh, libraries are primarily in the southwest of the country, in uh, just north of Bobo Jalasso. You see the large city down there in the southwest. So that's what I'll be talking about mostly today. 
Uh, the economy is uh, of Burkina and the other uh, places that we served is, is very poor. GDP per capita in Burkina is about $500 per person. Uh, People primarily earn their livings through agriculture, so Burkina Faso is one of the most rural countries in the world. About 70% uh, of the population lives in, in villages, uh, and farming then is the, the main economic activity. And this is a typical cotton farmer in Burkina taking, uh, taking the cotton uh, to, for sale. Uh, the, other crops are sorghum, millet, uh, corn, sesame, groundnuts. There's, of course, extensive livestock pr production. Uh, most of the areas that we operate uh, do not have electricity, and, uh, and so uh, we uh, don't have computer centers or IT centers in, in the libraries that we, that we support. Uh, these communities uh, typically are very gendered, uh, and girls are, are quite clearly disadvantaged in, in schooling and in being able to make their life choices. Uh, and these are um, these are uh, uh, one one of the uh, kind of areas, uh, social areas that we try and address in, in our libraries to make them uh, extremely. Uh, girl friendly and support uh, girls in, in their abilities to realize their, uh, their potential. We shouldn't neglect boys, of course. Um, boys in particular in recent years in West Africa have been lured away from schooling and book learning uh, and, uh, and are working in gold mines. Uh, and, and this is a, a big issue, estimated that about two or 300,000 youth in Burkina Faso now are working in uh, small artisanal gold mines uh, rather than, than being back in, in school. Schools, of course, aren't, uh, aren't all that attractive in Burkina Faso. Uh, they're, they're crowded. They're very low quality. This is a typical primary school classroom uh, with uh, 100 and 20 students uh, with two teachers uh, that serve the, the classroom. So as you can see, there's not very many resources uh, for effective learning that go on in much of the schooling system in, in Burkina Faso. So uh, our, our goal is to promote reading, uh, both in Burkina Faso and the other countries where we operate, Uganda, uh, Northern Ghana, uh, and Tanzania. Uh, and, and this is a hard goal. Village readers uh, are typically uh, first generation readers. Their, their parents are often not literate. In Burkina Faso, rural adult literacy rate are only about 25%. And, and for women, for adult women, this is usually lower. About 10% of adult women uh, have completed primary school and, and are effective readers. So there's, there's a, a very poor literacy environment uh, in, in the villages. Most households do not have books. They certainly don't have children's books, uh, picture books and, and the like. Uh, government has very limited reading promotion programs. Uh, again, to take the example of Burkina Faso, uh, the country has about 8,000 villages and small towns. And the government currently operates maybe 25 uh, libraries in those 8,000 villages and small towns. So, so there's a lot of room for growth and promoting uh, reading and the reading culture in, in the region. Uh, uh, reading culture, as all of you know, of course, competes with uh, other media. And uh, currently, uh, smartphones are expanding very rapidly. Uh, people are increasingly using smartphones. They, they, they've been, for the last 10 years, uh, using uh, uh, dumb phones, that is, using SMS messaging as a way to communicate. But increasingly, smartphones are penetrating uh, the country, and, and that's the kind of reading now that most people are engaged in. Uh, and that's quite different from uh, reading uh, youth, youth uh, novels or young adult novels or uh, novels intended for grown-ups or children's books. Uh, and that's one of the deficiencies uh, that we try to address at Friends of African Village Libraries. So as I noted, we support 13 libraries in, in Burkina, active in Ghana and Uganda. Uh, and we currently have expansion plans that we've just begun to establish 20 more libraries. And I'd be happy to talk about those uh, expansion plans uh, after. These libraries uh, are typically small, single room uh, affairs with about uh, 2,000 books, a paid librarian. 
Uh, we host a lot of reading programs at the libraries as funding permits, summer reading camps, uh, after school reading camps. I'll talk about those in a, in a little bit. One thing that I want to mention, it's very clear that uh, Africa-oriented books are greatly preferred by readers, and uh, I'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. Um, just to give you an idea of what these libraries look like, um, these libraries are all community libraries. That is, we deliberately do not uh, uh, support or establish school libraries. Uh, our mission is to support community libraries that are typically located in the heart of the community uh, and that are open to, to all. So they're free public libraries, uh, and, uh, and, and that's basically a choice that we made early on when we when we started. Um, and the main uh, mission of the libraries is, is to promote reading. Um, people are invited, <coughs> communities are invited to come and read uh, in the libraries. Everyone is free to come to the library and, and grab a book and, and sit down and, and read. Uh, one thing that we have noticed uh, in our experience is uh, people sometimes are skeptical about whether rural villages uh, have readers, have people interested in coming uh, and reading. Uh, and I think we can say with confidence that that is definitely not the case. Typical village library has uh, about uh, from 50 to 100 visits per day. Um, and uh, sometimes it's always the, the same people uh, who are coming uh, quite frequently uh, over the course of the of the week. But uh, we see we see a lot of readers. We see a lot of very avid readers who are coming and checking out a book every two or three days uh, and and going through our collections faster than we can replenish the the collections. The uh, the books are also uh, sorry. The books can be checked out, and uh, people are free to read outside and uh, take the books home. Uh, if you want to take books home, you have to subscribe to the library. The subscription fee, in order to check books out, is very modest. is about uh, 25 cents for school children and about uh, 75 cents for adults. That's for a year subscription. So that very modest fee on 50 cents uh, per, per person for a year enables a person to check books out. We usually get about three to 400 subscribers in, in each library over the course of the year. So that's the demand for uh, leisure reading is clearly there in these villages in, in Burkina Faso. Librarians are also trained and, and try to promote reading culture by engaging in story time, the typical activities of, of librarians everywhere, especially children's librarians. This is difficult because most of the librarians are, are adults and they've never had story time themselves. They've never been read to uh, when they were children. And so it takes a lot of training to overcome the, that initial hesitation about reading books aloud, about using funny voices to imitate the different uh, characters in a, in a book. Libraries are also places for leisure activities, so most of our libraries will have uh, games like checkers or mancala, a typical African counting game with, with stones, much like backgammon. And these are very popular in the in libraries. And it's not uncommon to see a small group of five to ten kids outside the library playing one of the games in the, in the libraries. We also, as I noted, uh, do reading activities like summer reading camps. And uh, these are typically last a week to two weeks. Uh, eight hours a day, breakfast and lunch will be included, and kids are extremely eager to participate in these camps. This is usually the only time that they get to do learning that's fun. Most of the schooling, as you saw, is in very crowded classrooms and a lot of rote learning. So the camps are extremely popular. We wish we had more funding to carry them out. Uh, but uh, we typically are able to do one to two camps uh, in every library each, each summer. We also see the libraries as places of innovation. This is a, a good argument for public libraries as, as institutions that are places where new ideas can be tested out and uh, 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 shared with the community. For example, one of our libraries, and now several others now, uh, are the first places in the region that have separate latrine facilities for males and, and females. <coughs> I mentioned the reading programs. 
Uh, and I just want to briefly go through the five programs that we have experimented with over the years and, and find pretty successful. Some are reading camps, as I mentioned, uh, through funding from the Chen Yat-sen Foundation in Ghana. Our three libraries there have over the past year done after school reading programs where kids come for two hours uh, in the late afternoon after school has been let out. They go home, then they come back to the library and do a bunch of guided reading exercises. We also in Burkina Faso have had a program to distribute solar powered lanterns to encourage reading at night. As I said, most houses don't have electricity, so if kids are going to read at night, they're either reading by a uh, kerosene lantern or by a, um, a candlelight. Uh, that's pretty hard on the eyes, big uh, uh, discouraging uh, fact of life in rural areas that there just isn't any electricity uh, discourages uh, reading. We also, uh, and I'll talk about an evaluation of this program, had in Burkina Faso over 2013-2014 a youth reading program where we delivered books to about 300 youth uh, in the surrounding villages, youth uh, being uh, young adults age 15 to 24, uh, and encouraged them to, to read. And uh, our current project is funded uh, by uh, IFL and is a uh, program to encourage health reading clubs uh, for young women, uh, again uh, aged in, in, in their late teens, uh, where they come to the library every week and read uh, health uh, related literature uh, using smartphones. So the in idea is to in, in induce uh, these young women to the library by introducing them to new technology that they've seen other people using and they know is out there and uh, coming to the library and using the smartphones that are in the library uh, enables them to sort of get a, a jump start. So they learn how to use Facebook, uh, they learn how to send messages using smartphones. It's a big draw. We, we See, have seen very good turnouts, and and the then the the main effect, of course, is that all the while that they're using this new electronic tool, they're reading material about uh, improving their their health and the health of their peers. I wanted to talk about one of our main programs uh, at Favel, which is uh, about. Uh, eight years ago, we uh, noticed that the readers really were preferring to read content that was relevant to their own lives. Uh, so rather than donated books uh, coming from, from the United States or from France, the, the language of schooling in Burkina Faso is French, so there we, the libraries are basically stocked with French books and some local language books, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute. So uh, we started creating content uh, for ourselves um, and, and producing printing uh, books for ourselves. In 2007, we initiated a, a photo book production line, and in 2013, we initiated uh, a multimedia center in the town of Hyundai, which is in the center of many of the libraries that we support, that produces locally authored what we might call pamphlet books. Uh, our perspective is to make a lot of books quickly and, and cheaply. Uh, these are books that are intended to be read 50 to 100 times by, by eager readers. Uh, if you think about the cost of the book as being maybe $5, then you're getting each book read uh, for, for a nickel, for five cents. Uh, pamphlet type books that are not as high quality as uh, premium books that might be available here uh, are going to uh, get destroyed after 100 reads. They, they won't last. This is a very tough environment on books, these rural villages uh, where uh, people are living mostly with dirt floors um, and, uh, and, and just a tough environment for, for books. Um, these books then, uh, fast and cheap is our, is our motto for creating creating these books, and I think we've, we've shown quite clearly, I'll give, show you some examples now, of how literate, hardworking people uh, in working in teams can, can easily produce books that attract readers. So let me start first with some of the photo books. Uh, Chelsea Rangel, a volunteer, spent six weeks in Burkina Faso 
back in 2007. Uh, she had a digital camera and we asked her to make some photo books and uh, one of the most popular books now in the library is this book in French. It's uh, called Comment fait-on le dolo? In English that means how do you make dolo, which is a brewed sorghum beverage that people in all these villages drink. Uh, and it's typically women's work. Uh, so the book is very popular amongst girls who, who are aspiring and, and will become makers of Dolo. The book is also translated into Jula, which is one of the local languages widely spoken in the area. There's very little reading uh, of, of this language in the area. So we try and make every effort to promote local languages and, and one way is by having these books that we produce ourselves be also translated and printed in local languages. Uh, we had another volunteer, Amy Reggio, go into uh, a set of books oriented for girls and one of them is a very popular title called My Favorite Book, Mon Livre Préféré, which features profiles of about 20 young women, girls from the villages, each one holding up their favorite book uh, and explaining why that book is their, is their favorite book. Another book that Amy did was called uh, A Day in the Life of the Midwife and it just is a very simple, straightforward uh, photo book about uh, the village midwife, uh, what she does both for her job, delivering babies and, and tending to new mothers uh, and in her ordinary private life, uh, cooking and uh, cleaning uh, in, in, a, in her home. So it's a very nice, uh, sweet book that lots of girls in particular in the village like to, like to read. And I just want to, you know, shout out to Amy Reggio again uh, because uh, one of her other books uh, was is probably the most popular book uh, in the in the libraries that we uh, support. It's called My Mother and Me, and it's basically just one day in the life of a 15-year-old who goes out with her mother to conduct their ordinary farming activities. So it just follows her throughout the the day. Uh, since then, we've 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 produced. I'll, I'll show you in a second uh, about uh, uh, 80 uh, of these photo books. Uh, very popular also are uh, a book about the parts of the body. Uh, this one by Elena Geralt that is a very typical children's book, right? Just showing eyes, ears, nose, hands, uh, and and such. These books are all printed through an online print-on-demand publisher called Fast Pencil, which many of you librarians will be very familiar with. So we have our, our channel or our site, our marketplace uh, on Fast Pencil. Uh, you can just search uh, for Fast Pencil and then Friends of African Village Libraries or Travel Africa and you can see all of the photo books that we have produced and if you're a French speaker this will be very attractive for you. We also have a whole bunch of uh, English speaking books, uh, uh, English language books uh, that we've translated to in the, uh, on, the, on the website. We moved in the last uh, several years to having locally authored uh, books and we're very proud of our very first locally authored book which was called Professional Woman, uh, I Am a Mechanic. And uh, the illustrations were done by a local illustrator and the text by actually one of our employees uh, at the time, Kura Donkwi. And this is just, again, a very straightforward book about a female mechanic who sets up her own business and is very successful. So it tries to be uh, inspiring for girls to think about other occupations that they might choose rather than the very traditional ones that they're typically slotted into. Another book that we uh, developed with a collaboration between a, a Peace Corps volunteer and uh, one of our staff members is about how to build, a, how to construct a an improved latrine, a VIP latrine as they're called, a uh, much uh, more sanitary kind of latrine in the, in the villages. And uh, Dunko, Sanu Dunko, our uh, employee, went out and, and took the photos and worked with Crystal Austin on the, on the text. Uh, and this is the kind of book that's very appealing to adults in the library because it basically goes through in very simple French how to build one of these improved latrines and why one would build one of these improved latrines. Dunko also uh, developed a very nice photo book uh, of, his, uh, of his daughter uh, visiting the garden of the village uh, and again, it's very simple French but it's the kind of French that most kids aren't exposed to and as you know, uh, kids learn vocabulary by absorbing it 
naturally by seeing words in, in context. So a kid may never know or be exposed to the word for watering can, which is in French uh, arrosoir, but seeing it in context of a book, they immediately know that this is uh, a watering can, and that's how you spell a watering can, uh, and this uh, reading is an extremely effective way to acquire vocabulary. We're also very proud of uh, local history books. As, as you know, local history books are very popular everywhere in the world, and, and we've been developing a few of them. This one's about one of the residents of the village who participated uh, back in the 1950s in the French colonial army. So he had a small cache of photos from the 1950s. The book starts with the photo that he took in a photo studio himself back in the 1950s. Uh, just before he headed off to join the colonial army. And the book closes with a photo of him now. Uh, he's about 80 years old and still uh, lives in, in the village there. So that's a very popular book uh, in the whole region. People know this uh, gentleman, uh, have heard about him, and now they get to read his story. So as I said, these photo books are extremely popular. We have a number of other uh, African authored or African themed books. Uh, Fatou Keita is a very popular children's book writer in West Africa. Uh, and we feel like, gosh, we can compete with Fatou Keita. And Kathy Knowles, I'll talk about a little later, uh, has done a set of photo books that are extremely popular in Ghana and very much distributed in Ghana. Kathy was actually the inspiration for this, for this project. We uh, lately, as I mentioned, have moved to, with a grant from Rotary International, to doing more kinds of pamphlet style books that are authored and illustrated by uh, people from the communities. Uh, and I'll just go quickly through some of these books. The, the first one in our series was called The Dream of Olivia, and it's about a young girl in the village who, who dreams of someday going to school, uh, and of course your dream comes true. These tend to be very optimistic books. Uh, another book is uh, Short History by uh, Bonde Susunovo uh, about a, a man in, in his village who has become a very successful agriculturalist, uh, and the book starts by uh, showing how he planted some orange trees and started harvesting the oranges and saved his money, expanded his orchard, and eventually had sort of a modern farm in the village. Another uh, book that I like, uh, great illustrations by Dafeo Gowin Songding, uh, is about a, a, just a, the title is called a, a Young Boy Who's Hardworking. And it's about how hard work can enable you to succeed in life. These are very kind of typical books that people produce as their first, uh, as their first effort. This is our multimedia center. It sounds grand, but really it's just a couple of computers and printers where all the books are printed and then assembled, stapled. Uh, covers are a little bit uh, more durable on cardstock. Uh, we were fortunate to have Molly Morrison, a Peace Corps volunteer, spent a year helping us set up this multimedia center, and now it's operating independently. Molly also was able to organize a lot of Peace Corps volunteers to come and give, uh, those who are good illustrators, to come and give workshops to the local illustrators. So here you see one of them, very typical uh, workshop that we sponsor through the Multimedia Center. I have to add parenthetically that uh, this whole book production uh, process was uh, the excuse for me to publish my very first children's book, which is in English is called Where Is My Chicken? Uh, and it's a, a little tale wonderfully illustrated by Ezekiel Olvera, who was another volunteer who, who spent some months in the villages and is a great watercolorist. The uh, book really is, is due to him because uh, his watercolors were just so fantastic. I said we have to do something together. And uh, that book is available on Fast Pencil if you want to uh, order it. Just a little another, this is the inside cover. Um, so uh, just to summarize this uh, digression on, on creating content, we've uh, published uh, now more than 80 photo books. They're available on Fast Pencil. That's the link uh, there that you have. And, uh, the, uh, uh, we produced uh, now uh, over 40 books in the Multimedia Center by local authors. 
So my main lesson learned is uh, it can be done. You're a librarian. You can do this in your library using Fast Pencil. You can have books about your local community in Fast Pencil. It's very modest. All you need is a digital camera, some creativity. Fast Pencil is very easy. Uh, other, you know, print on demand sites are great too. Uh, the virtue of Fast Pencil is it's quite cheap. Um, so their philosophy was to be a lot less expensive than uh, many of the more expensive competitors like Blur and peekaboo. Um, so uh, uh, I don't want to recommend any particular site. They're all great. Uh, and at low uh, production numbers, if you're just printing 10 copies, the total budget you'd need for this is just $200 to produce a set of photo books about uh, your, your own community. Let me talk uh, now a, a, a bit about some, some research projects. I'll, I'll talk for about 10 more minutes and then take some questions. Um, from from people in the audience. I, I love getting your uh, um, uh, chat uh, tweets. Thank you very much, Meili, uh, for that. Uh, I, I published a number of uh, articles and, and books, and I'll give you a link at the end where you can uh, explore for, for further reading uh, some of these uh, some of these books on, on rural community libraries and, and articles on specific reading programs. One of the things that initially I did uh, very early on was publish a couple of articles just trying to measure, well, what was the impact of uh, having village libraries? How, how much did it increase reading? Uh, and we compared them. Uh, Villages that had government libraries, these are called the CLOC or BCLPs, with villages without the CLOC or BCLPs. Uh, and then uh, we compared our own village libraries in the region of Hyundai that I mentioned earlier to villages that are comparable villages. And comparable here means had, having a secondary school. So it was the closest village that had a secondary school to the villages that uh, we had located libraries uh, in. And if you focus especially on the Hyundai region comparison, we asked three questions about reading habits, and it's, it's hard to measure reading habits, so we're not going to pretend that these are uh, extremely accurate, uh, but uh, the, the pattern that emerges is pretty consistent. So we asked three questions. How many books had you read in a year? How many books had you read in the previous 30 days? And then we gave them a list of 25 well-known books, and, and these are from uh, secondary school students. So they're, they're teenagers who are in basically the equivalent of 10th grade. Uh, we asked them uh, from this list of well-known authors how many they had read. So if you compare the villages without libraries, you can see, for example, from the list of 25 books read that uh, the average for the places without libraries was 7.18. The average uh, number for villages with libraries was 12.67. These are pretty large sample, so statistically significant differences. For books read in the previous 30 days, we go from 1.65 to 2.18. And for books read in the year, we go from 5.64 to 8.77. These are pretty substantial. They may not seem like much, but if you think of it in percentage terms, these are quite substantial increases. So the books read for the, uh, from the list of 25 books, uh, that that's about an 80% increase uh, go, to go from 7 to, to 12. Uh, to go from 5 to 8, again, is about a 50% increase. So these are pretty substantial percentage increases in the number of books read. So even if they aren't uh, very accurate, kids, of course, have an incentive to to sort of overestimate how much they're reading, uh, they still show quite substantial effects from, from having libraries in the, in the community. We recently did another survey uh, for, for our youth and twee reading project where we surveyed uh, about uh, 700 uh, students. Some of them were 700 youth, uh, 400 of them were in communities with, without libraries, and 300 of them were in communities with, with libraries. So we asked similar questions. Uh, one in particular, how many titles can you write down uh, of books that you have recently read? So in the villages without libraries, the average number of titles was 0.26, less than one title. Uh, in villages with libraries, the average wasn't real high. It's 0 0.50, so that's not super high, but it's double uh, that of the villages without libraries. So that's a 100% increase in reading from the presence of village libraries. So village libraries definitely do have big effects on how much reading happens amongst uh, at least this intended audience of, of 
uh, secondary school students. I want to talk a little bit about a reading program that we implemented in uh, rural Burkina Faso. I was interested in the effects on economic preferences uh, of reading fiction. So as all of you know from the work of Stephen Crash and others, reading has huge effects on reading. Uh, reading a lot makes you a better reader, but a lot of people throughout uh, the last um, uh, several decades have, have also thought that reading does more than that. It gives you better social skills, it gives you empathy, reading is good, it's virtuous for you as a person. It has all these nice effects. So I was trying in this research project to measure some of those effects. So we had about 700 youth apply to be uh, in this reading program, of which we selected uh, close to 300 to participate in the program and 260 to be a control group. And that selection was random, so it was a proper randomized control trial. Kids in the program then received a book or a bande dessinée, a graphic novel, every week for about 20 weeks over the course of the year. Uh, and we measured the impact through surveys, through experimental games, and I won't have time here to talk about them. You, I'll give you the link at the end to the reading. These experimental games measure trust, uh, willingness to contribute to the public good, uh, willingness to take risks, uh, willingness to be, to be patient. And I, I just want to give you in graphical form some of the results. These graphs are a little uh, complicated, uh, but again, I refer you to the paper. Basically, on the x-axis there, we're measuring their um, their reading frequency before the program started. So it's their reading frequency controlling for who they are, so controlling for their gender, controlling for their uh, level of schooling that they had, controlling for their age, uh, controlling for their ethnic group, how, how much reading did they have? So were they a, a, a much better reader given their uh, age and gender than, than average? Then they'd have a high score in that initial uh, measure of reading. And on the y-axis we have a similar residual measure for how much extra reading they did uh, a after the program had, had uh, been underway for some time. And the, uh, the two different kinds of uh, dots there, the squares and the uh, diamonds, are for the participants in the program, the ones who were reading, and then the diamonds for the control group. And then the dashed line and the more solid line give you sort of the average effect of the program. And you can see that the dashed line is quite a bit above the solid line, confirming that the reading program actually led to a lot more reading, uh, at least as measured by the number of titles that people could list that they had read in the previous 30 days. So the program was effective in that sense that if you distribute kid titles to um, uh, kids to read, they actually do read them. On the other hand, in terms of you know how much they affected people in terms of empathy or trust or willingness to contribute to public goods, there you can see the two lines uh, overlap. There was no effect at all of the reading program on uh, how much people were willing to contribute in these kind of real money trust games that we played uh, with the participants and, and with the control group. Uh, similar for taking risks, there was no difference at all between the two groups, and similar for patients measured by the discount rate, so we gave them basically choices about would you like to get the equivalent of two dollars today or, or or $5 in a, in a month uh, from now, there was no difference between the participants and the control group. So a little, uh, uh, for those of you who thought that there would be a lot of effects on people's personalities and choices and economic preferences uh, from, from exposure to books, it turns out that uh, at least in this one area, this one region of the world where we implemented this program, there weren't any big effects. Uh, there were zero effects, in fact. Um, let me talk very briefly and then I'll close uh, about another uh, project that we ran uh, to uh, give access to solar reading, uh, to, to solar powered lanterns for promoting night reading, and I'll use the same method to uh, measure that. Uh, we we had this program that we uh, distributed these solar lanterns and encouraged uh, some kids to read alone, some kids to read in groups, and some kids to read in, with their families. Uh, and the, the effects here are how many books they, on how many books they've read in the previous 30 days. And, and the two uh, lines, now you see there's a little bit of difference, especially for the good readers, for the 
poor readers who have their reading test scores uh, below zero, there's really there's really no uh, effect at all of this solar reading. Uh, the solar lamp uh, uh, program, uh, but for good readers who are doing well in the initial uh, test of reading abilities, there's a there's about an eight percent increase in reading. So solar lanterns are probably not a very cost-effective way to increase reading, but they they will do some have some effect on increasing reading. Uh, there was no effect, however, uh, on the test scores themselves, so all that extra reading that they did with these solar uh, lamps didn't actually enable them to perform better on a reading test. It's a small sample, wasn't, uh, it's a sample of several hundred kids, not, not that small. Uh, it would be nice to replicate this kind of research at a, at a larger scale. Um, so let me close very quickly by talking about uh, this nascent social movement. We're not the only organization doing this. I've given you a list of some other organizations. If you type their names into Google, you'll easily uh, find them. Uh, there's some larger organizations like Room to Read that primarily work with governments, uh, especially working on school libraries. Uh, and then there's other organizations that are primarily book provision organizations that uh, ship uh, books over to uh, libraries in Africa. We've seen a lot of activity over the last 10 years since I've been involved promoting reading. And I think it's really exciting time for people who are interested in promoting libraries and, and books, in, uh, especially in rural uh, Africa. Let me talk a little bit about the uh, challenges and then save the rest for, for talking in the question and answer period. The uh, main challenge that we have uh, are with, uh, with three actors, uh, local communities, national library authorities, and, and outside NGOs, and there are different challenges uh, with each of those. So we partner with local institutions to establish our libraries, which are community libraries, but uh, we need a community partner if we're going to have a community library. And that's tough in a place like Burkina Faso because Burkina Faso only decentralized political administration in 2006. So before that, there was only a central national representative uh, uh, who administered uh, a, a larger region, and villages had no local political structures. And since 2006, rural communes have been established and mayors elected, but a lot of the mayors are not literate. A lot of the councillors in the rural communes are not literate. They, the mayors uh, do not get paid, actually, uh, don't receive salaries, so they're working basically entirely as volunteers uh, for, for their communities, and so they're, they're time to devote to supervising, managing, uh, and partnering for village libraries is, is really challenging. Uh, and just as a kicker for some of the challenges of partnering with local institutions in October, there was a national uprising in Burkina Faso that ousted the dictator of 27 years. Uh, the transition government suspended all local government uh, and did not has, has, has been very slow in replacing local government. So we currently don't actually have any clearly uh, defined partners in the villages where we support uh, our, our libraries. That's just the tip of the iceberg of, of what kind of challenges we face in local communities. Uh, those challenges are even more difficult at the national level. Some countries like Kenya have very active, uh, very well-funded national library services. And Burkina Faso, on the other hand, public libraries are supported by a, a division called the Senalak. Uh, it's a division of the Ministry of Culture. Basically consists of an office with three or four staff members who have no budget to actually do any programs. So the budget is basically just their salaries uh, and, and nothing else. So they don't produce any reports, there's very little public accountability of whatever they do do uh, during the year when they are receiving their salaries. Very frustrating to, to partner with them. We, we continue to reach out with them and hope that as personnel changes, especially in this transition period, we'll, we'll have more um, effective partnership. With outside NGOs uh, like uh, Eiffel, like Rotary International Catholic Relief Services, uh, those are those are our really wonderful partners. Uh, been very supportive of our efforts over the over the years. The the big challenge with those outside organizations, for any of you thinking of launching 
uh, small nonprofits is, is that they uh, impose extremely on onerous uh, reporting and accounting requirements that take up a lot of management time. Uh, and sometimes their interests aren't fully aligned uh, with the interests of the, of the organization. So as, as you might imagine, being, being librarians or uh, librarians in training, um, there's a huge push on for, you know, fads and, and what's new. A lot of uh, push for uh, new technologies in, in libraries uh, and just new innovations in, in libraries. We're operating in rural villages where we still have to get books uh, into libraries and we still have to have sort of basic effective reading programs. Um, so I want to close there uh, and thank you very much for listening and uh, I'd enjoy hearing uh, any questions that you might have uh, and responding to them uh, now. So I'll, I'll pause and see if anybody wants to write something in on chat or just uh, interrupt. Uh, first of all, Michael, thank you. This was absolutely fantastic. Uh, more than I uh, had any idea uh, of what was going on over there, so it, it was great. Uh, I see a couple of people um, writing some stuff. I do have a question. I think the um, yep. way you've gone about producing the local material uh, is, is absolutely a wonderful way to get people interested in reading over there and again focusing on, on their own environment and what they see and are familiar with rather than trying to find either English language material shipped over from here or French language material shipped over from wherever. Are you aware of other organizations that are trying to do something similar or are you fairly unique in that regard? No, I wouldn't say we're unique. Uh, so as I, as I mentioned uh, just in passing, we were actually inspired by Kathy Knowles, who's uh, the director of an uh, organization that's listed earlier called the OSU Children's Library Fund that uh, is supporting large urban libraries in Ghana. So her organization, I think now they've, uh, uh, they've helped build and establish and fund five uh, large urban libraries. And you have to go to your, their website, OSU Children's Library library fund um, to look at these beautiful urban libraries that they're funding. And if you, if you have any connection to Ghana, uh, definitely contact them and, and try and spend some time volunteering in those, uh, those community libraries. They're really wonderful. Uh, and so Kathy has been producing uh, and, and publishing on a much larger scale than we publish. Uh, she's been producing children's books, beautifully illustrated children's books and, and photo books uh, for, the, for the last uh, decade and a half. Uh, um, another organization that we partner with is Maria's Library in Kenya, uh, and they've been uh, trying to pioneer establishing uh, what we might call a, a smartphone books, right? So increasingly uh, communities are using smartphones, so just like with iPads, we try and adapt our reading material uh, to those kinds of smartphones and tablets. They've been, they've been trying to generate locally produced stories and uh, adapt them to smartphones. So, so there's, a, there's a big community trying to, trying to do this. We're not the only ones. Great, thanks. Um, any uh, other questions from any of our audience? Uh, just uh, grab, go ahead, please grab the mic. Hi, Dr. Kavane. Thank you for giving such a great presentation. I found this really, really informative. Um, um, I too am also very, very interested and very serious about um, going abroad and uh, bringing um, resources and educational materials abroad, especially to uh, rural villages in Africa. And I'm not sure where to start, but I felt like this is such a great presentation. And um, I'll start by looking at some of the organizations that you listed. Um, I, one of my questions is, are there any particular courses, um, classes, or subjects that you'd recommend to take in the MLIS program that would benefit if someone were interested in conducting projects and implementing programs like these abroad? Uh, 
That's a great question. Uh, and first, uh, that would be so wonderful if you were able to make it work to go out and, and do some um, do some work with community libraries. Uh, I, it's extremely rewarding to do that. Um, and so I want to you know encourage you and do feel free to get in touch with me. You have my uh, website there, and you can you can find my uh, email on the on the website. Um, I, I don't want to plug my own book too much, but uh, uh, the book that's uh, up there uh, on uh, community libraries in rural Africa, uh, uh, published, uh, uh, authored by myself, uh, Valida Dent, a, a colleague who's the dean of the library at uh, Long Island University, uh, and, uh, and uh, Jeff Goodman, who's a psychologist who's become very interested in reading to small children and, and its effects on, on young, very young children. Um, that book is a great place to start. Uh, plenty of reference materials. We have a whole chapter about sort of doing research and volunteering in community libraries in Africa. So I think you'll find that, that book very helpful. Uh, and you can always ask your local library to order the book or get it through interlibrary loan. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, MLS, MLIS programs vary a lot. So I, I don't know what the course offerings are. Uh, and I think any uh, course offering that's uh, dealing with developing countries would probably be the most useful course you could take. I'll, I'll maybe turn it over to Bill uh, if uh, you have some better advice about what courses to take. We, yeah, I, we have on occasion had a, a seminar uh, that has dealt with international librarianship and um, it's a question of finding someone who can uh, teach that and getting it into the schedule. And it's usually run, I think, under our uh, 281 heading, uh, a seminar in contemporary issues, or 282, the uh, management seminar series. So you can look for that. But um, what Michael's not aware of, and unfortunately um, for most of you if you're already in the program, is that there's a new initiative at San Jose State to try to help internationalize the curriculum, which I just started. And uh, so beginning, I think to some extent this semester, but more next semester, um, we're supposed to try to have some sort of international aspect in almost every course, uh, if nothing else, to allow you to uh, sort of customize to the extent that you can assignments to take a look or, or bring in an international perspective as opposed to just focusing on libraries and issues in the United States or even in North America because we do have uh, a number of uh, students from Canada. So I think, um, I mean, to some extent the timing of Michael's presentation today and the one, the, the colloquium we had in January on the Lubuto Library project uh, will help us get us started in that direction and help um, the iSchool uh, maintain more of an international focus because, again, I, I think what, what they're doing over there uh, is, is really good considering uh, the numerous hurdles that they, ha that they face and have to surmount from um, community and government support to, uh, you know, the fact that uh, the resources that they have over there are minimal and uh, that they, um, in fact, have to create many of their own to, uh, to bring reading to some of, of uh, these young people over there. So uh, any other questions or comments for Michael? Yes, sir, go right ahead and take the mic. Thank you very much, Michael, for a fantastic overview of the of uh, the work that Bobble's doing. I have two questions, and we may not have time for all of them, but um, my first one is uh, more abstract, and it uh, goes to the the notion of the young people that you're serving in the in the U.S. and the West in particular. The notion of young people is driven almost entirely by this notion of youth development which has lots of ideological um, and historical complexity to it that uh, libraries in particular, although other fields too, uh, seem ill-equipped to deal with in a critical way. 
So this notion of youth development has everything to do about becoming a middle class, uh, becoming middle class, having particular skills to be uh, to be effective in the marketplace. It's always based on um, notions of a future experience rather than focusing on one's experience as a young person in the moment, among many other. Uh, points of liability and, and concern. And I'm curious to know that b since it informs such a, a, a comprehensive view about how libraries in particular construct and deliver their services, I'm curious to, to know if, if you've talked at all or if, if, um, if the experience that you've got in the work that you're doing imagines young people in a particular way. Um, other than this, uh, this youth development model. Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, Anthony, for for a great question. Um, and I think uh, uh, I think I, I, I know what you mean. And I and I, I I think we do have a particular vision, and, and and a lot of it emanates from from me and from my my own vision. Uh, and and that is that I I really do uh, try and impart this idea as, as a library as a as a place that. First and foremost is, is serving leisure reading. Um, that is, and I think leisure reading is a really important way where uh, youth, in particular, can explore uh, their their identities, and uh, and it's through reading novels and, and through reading you know good fiction and short stories and graphic novels that that youth come to have a kind of a conversation with a bigger audience than than just their friends and, and neighbors. About you know who they are and what they want to do and um, and and just interpret and and make sense of the of the world around them. Uh, youth in Africa and especially in rural Africa you know, traditionally have not had much time to do that kind of identity exploration because they go right to work uh, and they spend most of the day working. And that's changing now as uh, rural Africa becomes wealthier and there's new opportunities and it's become part of uh, uh, increasingly, it's become part of local understandings that youth is is also this adolescent this period of adolescence, and and youth need to not be working, and that's fine, uh, and they need to be sort of exploring their own uh, identity. So that that's changing a lot, uh, and I think we we try and. I particularly try to resist uh, that the, there are very powerful forces that uh, want to turn libraries into training centers. Um, and, and I guess I, I feel like that's not the mission of the library to become a training center. That's somebody else's mission. And that's great if they're training centers. I have nothing against training centers. But, but like you said, those are primarily sort of very practical, very job market oriented. And, and that's not really the vision that inspires me for for why we want to encourage um, uh, youth in particular and adults uh, to, to read. So I appreciate the question. I hope we're aligned. So we'll get a chance to talk more about that. Uh, thanks. Any other questions or comments from anyone before we wrap up for today? I guess not. So, Michael, again, let me thank you uh, for uh, an outstanding presentation. Let me thank everyone for their uh, being here and their participation. Uh, there was a question about the uh, recording. Uh, so let me um, simply state that we will um, take Michael's slides and the, the audio version of this and, and we'll do a YouTube version. It takes us a couple weeks to, to get that uh, put together. Uh, if you're part of the iSchool community, we will put out an announcement with the link for that to uh, everyone. And if you're not, uh, we'll also send that link to Michael and he'll have it up on the FAVL uh, website as soon as that becomes available. So again, thank you for your participation everyone, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Bill.